So uh, Kyle Bader, I work at the storage BU at Red Hat. Um, been working on Ceph for a while. And um, one of the things that's been coming up recently is, is how do we kind of take, take Ceph and take object storage to the next, next level of scale, right? Um, I have this old logo from Ceph from like 2007 on here. We used to say it was petabyte scale storage. Well, it's like not cutting the muster anymore. So how do we adapt? Um, so some of the largest tests we've done were with maybe 10,000 OSDs every now and then, CERN, um, the same place that collides the particles. They'll say, hey, we're getting a new shipment of hardware in. Do you guys want to run some tests on it for three weeks? So um, we've done this a series of time. The most recent one we did was with 10,000 drives. Uh, so we built a 10,000 drive Ceph cluster, ran it for a few weeks, and um, each of these times we've kind of pushed it to make a bigger cluster. So if you look at the kind of the highest capacity drives that you can get these days, they're around 16 terabytes. And if you were able to have 10,000 of them, you're going to get into the on order of uh, 160 petabytes, which is a really big data store. But we have customers that are starting to say, hey, I want, I want 100, I want 200 petabytes of storage. What does this look like? And they also want to have access, like to really de demanding throughput, particularly if they're going to be using it for machine learning applications where you know, they're saying, hey, you know, I'm going to have all these cars that are going to be pumping all this data into this thing you know, on the order of petabytes per day. Um, and then I'm going to have to, every, few, every so often, every so many months, I need to go through all of the data and you know, retrain it with the, with the new fresh data. And so you're looking at like, a very serious amount of throughput demands. So we were kind of thinking, okay, well, well, how can we how can we kind of solve this? How can we kind of cater to these really really demanding use cases where you know people need hundreds of gigabytes per second of throughput? They need these you know 200 petabyte clusters. What can we do? So one of the things that was done a number of years ago was we were working with the Yahoo folks, and they kind of uh, we helped kind of co-develop an architecture where they had multiple Ceph clusters backing. Um, backing the storage for um, Flickr. And so um, we, you know, I think this, this same sort of, of architectural approach is still relevant today. And so kind of you can create an architecture that's kind of like a shoal or like a group of squids. So it's like you have a, a group of Ceph subclusters acting as a bigger cohesive whole with like a single namespace across of them so that you can have uh, you know, billions and billions and billions of objects and, and, you know, hundreds of petabytes worth of data. So what is, you know, what can you, what can you get out of this? Well, um, in terms of subclusters, we were kind of seeing w what sort of throughput you can get in and out of a relatively modest sized cluster and then you can kind of extrapolate things. So even with a relatively modest cluster of about 700 spindles, we were able to do a little a bit over a petabyte in 24 hours. So this is kind of validating the use cases where people are, you know, I need several petabytes a day on, on the order of how many disks you're gonna need in order to be able to absorb that much data. We wanted to see how many objects we could stuff into single bucket, right? So a bucket is like a flat namespace and people often will wanna put in um, many. So we tested, I think, up to, um, 250 million objects in a single bucket, which is, which is a lot. And you can see that our, our, our latency um, after kind of an initial step, there was some sharding where we internally shard the metadata, but after that we had very consistent latency even though we had you know, 250 million objects in a single bucket, which we consider to be a lot. But yet we also wanted to test you know, storing, well it's not a placeholder, but this is lightning talk, so. Um, we also wanted to see, you know, let's put billions of objects into the cluster in global. And so we did. We put, a billion, we put over a billion objects into the cluster and observed how the, the change in performance changed over time. Um, you'll see that it, it was relatively uh, the red bar being the, um, the latency, and then the blue bar is the object population. So our, our latency stayed relatively flat until the point where um, we were taking up all of the SSD for our metadata, and then we slowly we're starting to spill some of the metadata over to disk. So as there was a higher percentage, uh, you can think of it like as a cache mesh, right? So as, as less of it was on SSD, the more of it had to come from 
hard disk, the, that's why the latency was starting to creep up over time. And then for reads, it was relatively stable, right? Because it's still just gonna be a seek to read. Um, and you can't, there's not a lot you can do to accelerate the seek other than, you know, you can't cache the entire population of objects. Um, so with, with kind of those individual subclusters out of the way, you know, what is a, what is a shoal, what would a shoal look like? Well, in a Ceph multi-site topography, you have these ideas of zones and zone groups. And these zones and zone groups were originally kind of put into place to, in, or, in order to be able to do replication between them, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true. So by creating a realm, that's like a S3 global namespace for buckets, and then each zone group, a bucket can live in exactly one zone group, and then you can potentially configure, have multiple zones in a zone group, and then do replication between them. But if you only have one zone in each zone group, then you're basically just partitioning the namespace of buckets. So each bucket lives in exactly one zone group. And so if you're interacting with the object store, you don't necessarily need to, um, like you just have your, your, you know, your S3A path or you go to your um, you know, bucket.s3.example.com or whatnot, and it'll get routed appropriately. And the way this routing works, is um, DNS, right? So if you go to your s3.example.com, it's going to map to kind of the, the main IP address, and then, or if you go to use like path style access, you're gonna go through the s3.example.com. And this is gonna round, you know, you could potentially just round robin this around the cluster, as like in the most simplistic sense, but you could also potentially do something sophisticated in, you know, HA proxy, um, where you have some sort of Lua-based routing that that actually looks into the cluster to find out where a bucket lives, and you could kind of do it like a, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with like an SDN controller, but it's kind of like a first packet approach where you, you know, the first packet gets resolved by the control plane, and then it embeds kind of like a something in a lookup table so that subsequent ones don't have to go through that logic. You could do something similar to that. And then you'd have a separate cluster endpoint per subcluster, similar to how AWS has different um, endpoints for different regions, right? So you're effectively creating little regions that each have their own Ceph cluster. And then the, with a, some sort of DNS plugin, it would map, so if you say, you know, Kyle is the name of my bucket, I go to Kyle, right? You go to the DNS and you'd have a DNS plugin Right now, someone has written one for Power DNS that talks to Ceph and then says, oh, okay, this bucket is in this one, and then they'll respond with the record that'll route them to that cluster. Well, you could do the same thing, and I think kind of the, um, where you could kind of take this is to take it and put it into core DNS, and then if you had an operator that was deploying multiple clusters inside of an OpenShift, it could automatically configure all of this wiring and route the traffic appropriately. So that's kind of, uh, that was my quick, quick little talk. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much.